Hey, it's James from 4x4 Earth, and welcome to track 31 of the 4x4 Earth podcast, Driving the Canning Stock Route with Phil Bianchi. Join James from 4x4earth.com as he learns all there is to know about four-wheel driving, camping, fishing, and getting out and exploring our great country on the 4x4 Earth podcast. Okay, so this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Bill Bianchi, the guy who wrote the book on the Canning Stock Route, he's going to share with us all of the wisdom that he's got from all of the times that he has travelled the Canning Stock Route. So let's get right into it with Phil Bianchi. So one question that's in my mind, what sort of vehicles, and because people have been doing the uh, the Canning in all sorts of crazy, you know, the motorbikes, not that that's that crazy, but... Yeah two-wheel yeah. drives, all of those sort of things. What sort of vehicle should it be? What sort of mods do you need well, to go forward? Okay. Drive? Well, I would strongly recommend a high-clearance diesel four-wheel drive. Yep. They, they, you know, it's more economical. They've got more torque. They've got, they got the clearance, but less chance of benefits fires, all our diesels. The newer ones have got catalytic converters and all that sort of thing as well. But uh, a high clearance diesel would, I would say, is the way to go. Problems that people encounter is they, well, they're not prepared from a safety point of view, like EPIRBs and SAT phones and things, a first aid kit, even first aid training. I've been involved with two, how would you say, rescues off the canning due to health. Oh, sorry, directly involved with one, and I knew of another one, but I wasn't directly involved with it. We had to get this bloke off with a suspected heart attack from Durba Springs to Newman. It took us nearly 14 hours. And we couldn't go faster because there would have just, you know, there would have been two more people that needed a, an RFDS plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and we got him into Newman and the, the, the people there said we haven't got enough equipment to do the proper scan. So the RFDS him to Port Edlin and then the RFDS him to Perth. And he spent uh, three or four days in hospital in Perth, but that sort of thing, you need to be prepared and know that this might happen. And another thing I do, a lot of people may not realise this, that if a group of us are going, I say, look, I don't want to know your personal medical condition, Phil, you know, like me, but if you write down in an envelope the things that are wrong with you, and you, and if you need special medicine, like you need to have a tablet put under your tongue if this happens, Tell me the trip later where it is, and so I know where to get it. That's the first thing. The second thing is have a confidential envelope in your glove box. So if something goes wrong and you've passed out, we don't know what to do. We can rip the envelope open, have a look, and say, oh, he suffers from X, Y, Z. We ring up the flying doctor and have a talk to them. If there's no need to look at the envelope, we don't. Tear it up at the end of the trip and throw it away. Nobody has, has to know. Exactly, and too few people do that, I think. That's right, that's right. And so so then the, the vehicle prep, preparation, I've seen it over and over on the canning. I was down the bottom in there, we were having a cup of tea and this Lux came past and he's converted his Heyman Reese tow bar and put this um, slab of steel across and he had five jerry cans sitting on this bracket that was plugged into the Heyman Reese tow hitch. And as he went along, it rocked from left to right. <laughs> we thought, we thought, oh, you know, they they just don't know. They just think they're driving on bitumen or good gravel roads. I don't know. That's, you see all sorts of things. Oh, I'm not going to pay that money at that fuel at Kanawarity, three dollars forty a litre. That's a rip off. And they're only going to pay an extra hundred and fifty dollars. Yep. Two hundred dollars. So so what? You know, they'd be grateful the fuel's there. It's a, uh, it's only a small part of the cost of the trip. So, this guy, a Range Rover, pulling a tandem trailer with three forty fours on the back, and he was down in the station country, hadn't hit the first dunes yet. There's absolutely no way he'd have got up the canning with it. He couldn't have pulled it up. They don't check it out. People drive too fast. They overload their vehicles with everything you can imagine, and I've struck people, hard tyres, don't let the tyres down. One bloke, he's a, he was another Phil, he was in camp one night, he said, 
how did you guys get up that hill? We're up and down, up and down, up and down. We couldn't get up. I said, well, be able to, you got a turbo diesel cruiser. He says, oh, no, I couldn't get up. I said, what pressure are your tyres? He says, oh, 45. I said, oh, yeah. I said we, were, we put them down to 20 at the first dunes and they'll stay there till we get off the last dunes. Oh, no way, I'm putting it down to that. You'll, you'll get punctures. I said, well, you won't get over the dunes. So anyhow, the next day, they took off early. We found him there, the dune up and down, up and down. Couldn't get up. He said, you guys go first. So we just drove around the corner and just drove straight up and over the dune and gone because we were at 20 p- PSI. We met him later at lunchtime. He said, we let our tyres down to try what you said. He says, it, it works. I said, good. Just leave them like that for the whole trip. No, 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 no. I've pump, pumped them up again. No, oh, you know. Uh, what chance have you got? <laughs> That's if, really if, quite if sad, they're gonna, isn't it? They're going to damage their vehicle. They are going to damage the vehicle. They're going to damage the track because they're going to dig big holes that they try and dig their way up and force themselves up the hill. And they're using heaps of fuel and they're getting frustrated and annoyed instead of having a nice holiday. Yeah. Hey, and hard tyres. And the other bugbear for me is that people don't find out what's to see and do what the history is, you know, and uh, uh, one fellow spotted me reading a, a guide book. The, 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 uh, the husband and wife team, Eric and Ron Elgard, good friends of mine, they produced a guide book that's out of print now, but essentially it gives you the main things to see and uh, things to do and what to look out for on the canning. And you, you can read it and say, right, when you're at well 18, you do this, and between well 17 and 18... You can see this in set out at the four kilometre mark. There's a blaze tree or or whatever. And the bloke says to me, "What do you What do you got there?" And I told him, "I should." Sh- sh- he says, "Oh, oh, I wouldn't mind having to borrow of that." Well, I didn't get it back till the next day, and he's frantically writing notes of things to see because he'd missed all these things because he didn't know. And it's a shame. You know, yeah, that's they, sad, all isn't that it? Money, all that money they spent to do the canning. You know, it was a it was a, a mum and dad the son and his wife, separate vehicles, and, uh, you know, they wanted to see stuff, but they didn't plan to see stuff, which is a shame. Yeah, a shame. yeah. But there's other people, all, all they are, are interested in is just to do the, do the drive, you know, put the vehicle through its paces, use the diff locks, lower the tyres, drive to the conditions, learn things, see a few things, and just do the drive. They're not interested in the history or doing that extra looking around or whatever, well, that's, that's fine. But, you know, everyone's got different goals. But uh, at least uh, enjoy it. Camper trailers? No, I recommend no. I was going to ask that a, question. I think with those big sand dunes. Were. Yeah. I have a camper trailer. It's an off-road camper trailer. I could easily, it would easily handle terrain like the canning. But I don't want to spend... 21 days, struggling getting it over sand dunes, bang, bang, crash, clunk, bang, damaging stuff and the four-wheel drive trailer and scrambled eggs of uh, all your utensils and everything in the trailer. I'd rather enjoy my trip and have a good time. I would never take my camper trailer on the canning, even though I have one that could do it. I'll sleep in the tent and I use a camper trailer where I'm going to have a good trip and a more relaxing trip. And you do less damage to the track and you probably get off the other end with your marriage still intact. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yes. Well, you've seen it. Uh, and, you, you, and the people say, oh, I'm my camper trailer ball. Okay, you're probably a really good four-wheel driver and you put your tyres down to 16 or something like that and you get over the dunes. But nine people out of 10 or... 99 people out of 100 don't know how to do that. So they, the only way they do it is by planting foot and blast over the dunes, and that's what they do. And then, then, they, then everyone gets upset and grumpy. And So please, I strongly recommend leave your campus home, take a swag or a tent or a rooftop or whatever it is that you're doing and just re- have a more enjoyable and pleasant trip. Mm, that sounds like good advice. Well, how much water would you would you take with you? Well, how often can you refill? I I I, I have about sixty liters of what I call city drinking water, 
that's what my stomach is used to. And I guard that. I use it for drinking and um, maybe even making tea or something like that. I don't use it for washing and that because you can you 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 don't go more than about four or five wells and to not find a restored well with water in it. And so you keep separate containers of water for washing up, for showering, for washing your clothes or or whatever. And you guard your drinking water so that you don't end up with some sort of tummy you do trouble because you're drinking something you're not used to rather than you, you may not get the trots, but you might you might get a belly ache. Yeah. You know? So I take about sixty litres for about four weeks and that's purely drinking. And I, the rest of it I just fill at the wells to do to do whatever. And you know there's you know it's not a race. You pull up at a well and you think, oh, pretty good water here. Put the shower tent up, right out, line up, and people go and get the stuff out of their car and they, you have a shower at the well. You know, not at the well, and you go 50, 50 metres away, but the water's there. You don't have to go and cart that water so you can have a shower at night. I'll have a shower at 11 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon. So that's yeah. 60 litres, that be, that's for one person? Two. Two. Okay. Two, yeah. Yeah, because you also, well, I'm presuming you're drinking the odd um, lemonade, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, you're not just, you know. A couple of shandies each night, yeah. A couple of, yeah, you know, wine or beer or something, you know. But, yeah, I find I'm bringing water home, but it's always there. And as I say, there's so much water out there, the quality is dubious, but you can always go to the chemist and get those tablets, you know, what are they called? Um, What are they uh, Make the water safe to drink. Yeah, yep. Yeah, you know, just they don't cost much. A, and they're just like an aspirin. You just press them out of the pack and drop it in the water, and it's enough to do X liters. Water drinking water shouldn't be a problem on the canning. A lot of people drink it and they have no trouble at all and think it's great. You know, there's, it's not like you shouldn't drink any water on the canning. I just don't because I've got the the opportunity to drink city water that my a delicate stomach can handle it. Yeah. Delicate. <laughs> what about yeah. fuel? How easy is it to get fuel? You can buy fuel at Connawarity, which is well 33, and they've got the service station there, but it does close on Saturday afternoon. Well, it did, but I don't think it's, and I don't think it's changed. Closed on Saturday afternoon, closed all day Sunday. Otherwise, otherwise it's pretty much open the usual uh, uh, five and a half days a week. Put a little shop there that sells basics, you know, you'd be able to get the powdered milk and all sorts of stuff like baked beans and all sorts of bits, bits and pieces because that shop serves the uh, the local tra- traditional owners as well. Yep. And so that's about the 800 kilometre mark off the top of my head from the north, maybe the 700 kilometre mark from the north. And you've still got about 1,000 to 1,100 from there to the south. And there's two options from there, is to go down to Well 33 and then go out to the Cotton Creek community or Pangor, but it's about a, gee, I should have checked this out, about a 70k drive one way, and you can refuel there and then come back onto the canning again. But be warned, that road is, I've never seen the grade at that section. And the corrugations, if you reckon the corrugations on the canning are bad, uh, these ones cast shadows. Okay. So that's, that, that sounds and, scary. Yeah, it is. But, you know, don't drive fast. Get your tyres down to 18 and just slowly go along, you know. There's, and Or you can go again at Well 23 and there's a group. It's just changed. It used to be Capricorn Roadhouse near Newman. You could buy a drum of fuel and they would deliver it to Well 33 fuel dump, but it's now run by a separate group in Perth, but you only got to go onto the the various canning stock route sites, and they'll give you the phone numbers and, what, and whatever, and about every four weeks or so, they go out with a big truck, six-wheel drive, something or other, and put four to four-gallon drums of fuel down. It's got to be prepaid, and they write your name on the drum. So in my case, they'd have Bianchi, and it might be... Uh, one of four, two of four, three of four, and four of four. And they're just sitting there waiting for you to arrive. Yep. And, pe- and people say, oh, there's thefts and this and that. I've never, ever had fuel stolen. 
and really? all the times I've I've used it, never had fuel stolen. And I don't take, I don't use their pump because who knows what someone's done with it. I've I've just got a giant Tanamite pump. You know what a Tanamite pump is, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A giant one for forty fours. We just screw it in, start the compressor, and it just flies out like a service station pump. You you just fill your tanks and uh, away you go. And the, the fuel price is roughly the same as Tano or Warrity. Whatever one charges, the other charges. So there's not uh, people trying to struggle to get through and, oh, I forget, if I can make it, I can save 20 cents a litre. And they don't make it. They run out of fuel and they have problems. So I guess they make it the same price to stop any of that. As I say, I've heard of people claiming they've had fuel stolen. I've never had any stolen. And I've been getting fuel there oh, four or five times now. Now the but canning... Now to... Yeah, sorry. Hmm? You go. I've got a 250 litre fuel tank, so I don't need to stop there very often. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, the canning's renowned for its corrugations. Does the conditions ever t- change? Does it ever get graded? It never gets graded. Um, early in the season, the corrugations may not be as bad because there might have been... Uh, heavy rains during the summer months like 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 now there's a big rain bearing depression cutting a swathe right across from that area between well looking at the map out this this morning from the Kimberley down to Karatha and they're going right through the desert on an angle straight across south South Australia. It looks as though it's gonna have rain all all across that area. That rain can knock the corrugations down and flatten them out a bit. Yep. But you only need you only need a couple of vehicles with the 45 and 55 PSI in the tyres, and then you know what happens. Yeah. And because the corrugations aren't so bad, they can go fast. And of course, the faster you go, the worse it is in creating cor- cor- corrugation. Now, and you... uh, with the overloaded, hard tyres, going too fast, so do you have to do the whole canning or are there entry and exit points that you can sort of come in on? Well, the, the main entry and exit points, I would say uh, Billaluna down to well 33. And then from 33, you've got the option of going westward and end up in, say, Port Hedland or Nullagine or going westward and then southwest to lead to Newman. Or you go to the east. Wood, and you end up in Alice Springs on the Tanamai, not the Tanamai Road, the Gary Junction Road. That's at Well 33. And the next one down is roughly Well 23, and that's where Georgia Boar is, which is not a canning stock real well, but it's a good drinking water well. And from there, you can go to Jigalong and refuel, or well, you can go to Pangor or Cotton Creek and refuel, which is about 70 k's. Well, you can go through to Jigalong, which I can't remember how far it is, or through to Newman. So that's your escape route to the west. Yep. There's not really much of an escape route to the east, but if you continue on the Talawana to the east, you can end up at Windy Corner, and then you can go down to the Gun Barrel Highway and go to uh, Warburton that way, or you can go north on the Gary Highway to the Gary Junction Road and then go down to Alice Springs. So one could do the canning in three chunks Yep. if one couldn't afford the the time or they wanted to pick a particular section because they wanted to go to Derby Hills or whatever they wanted to do. And so you could do it in three chunks. Now, when do you reckon the best month of year is to do it? Um, and are there times probably, that you shouldn't do it? That, like, yeah, What's the difference between best and worst? Probably mid you know, early to mid-April is as soon as you would want to try and no later than about early to mid-September because early April to mid-April, you still got the heat at the north. You know, it hasn't quite got the winter months up there and there's still probably, there may be a lot of water around from the wet and you may not be able to get past Lake Gregory and you've got to go and do a 70 kilometre deviation or you can't do that, so you have to start at well 33 and go south and miss out on the top bit. So there could be things like that that'll mess you around. Then on the southern end, if you leave it too long, 
you can get 45 degree days out there in September, towards the end of September in, in into October. And you shouldn't want to be on, it, I don't think you would want to be on the canning then because it just puts too much stress on you. you know, you're hot and you're sweaty and you're grumpy and the car breaks down and you can't touch the sand because your hands are burning. And it's easier to get bogged because the, the hotter the sand is, the more powder it is, and the harder it is to get up the dunes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and then with the heat, there's more stress on the vehicle and the radiator is running hotter and there's more chance of things going wrong. So I'd, me, I wouldn't go anywhere sooner than mid-April and I'd be out of there by mid-September. So, and the best months would be June and July. Yeah, yep. Mm. You'll, you'll get frost at the bottom end, but you'll get beautiful blue days with hardly a cloud in the sky. That's most of the time. Unless you feel and he's going to Rudal River and he's out to the west and this big black cloud comes over, that happened in June, <laughs> and we got bogged bog for the three nights. <laughs> Any other advice then for someone who's planning on doing the the canning stock route for the first time? What are the other you know specific things that you'd be thinking about? I know you've mentioned things like EPIRBs and a sat phone. Would yeah. you take a sat phone? I do. Yep. Well, I just find it. You know, I can, my my wife isn't well and. I'm not very well either, and uh, you know I've been fighting prostate cancer for 11 years, so I need to, in case I need help. Yeah. But I could also also ring up, you know, and uh, just check to see how my wife is or whatever. And and if something breaks down, I mean, I've rung people and said, "Remember that wiring job you did?" I can remember this this guy after we got past the I want a warranty claim, and you coming out to fix it. He told me exactly what he did, and we were able to trace the wire find the thing and sort it out. And we could do that with a sat phone. Yep. It's a bit hard with a HF radio, but the HF radio was perfect for when we got bogged and we were stuck in that one spot and uh, we were able to talk for as long as we liked and other people would relay messages for us and, you know, the horses for of course. And the sat phone was a critical instrument in that guy that had a suspected heart attack and we had to drive him out from Durba. If we didn't have a set phone, I don't, I don't know what we would have done. I guess we would have just piled him in the car, not knowing what's wrong with him, and drove like hell and hope for the best. Yeah. Whereas they were able to say, uh, is there a nurse in the area? And we found a rural nurse. And then somebody else had one of those Royal Flying Doctor kits that have got all these medicines in it. Yep. And they said, well, go to get, you know, 53B or something and take two of those every four four hours so we're able to give some medication to this guy without a sat phone we couldn't have done that yes it's it's a good thing to have you can rent them you don't have to buy them yeah and what else would i suggest i would say read do research on the on the internet careful what you read make sure you trust the site and there's a few good sites there's the canning stock group facebook site that i that i started We've got 5,300 members now. And there's the Explore Oz. Have you, have you heard of them? Explore yes, Oz? yep. Yeah. They've got a brilliant canning stock route track note. If you get that and print that, you're 80% of the way in knowing what to do and what to see and be prepared. And there's all the phone numbers of the various police at Halls Creek and down the other end and all sorts of stuff that's very helpful. I'm not sure what Four by Four Earth has got it. Do, do you have track notes or? or yeah, there's some. Stuff? There is some information there, and there's a lot of people yeah. who've discussed. You know, the trips that they've done. There's a lot of photos as well. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's learn. You know. I mean, I will help anybody if I can. People ring me up like you did and have a chat. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk about it because I had to learn once, and people help me, so I'm happy to help the next lot. Yep. So don't be frightened to contact me or you'll find me on the internet. I've got, a, I've got email on the internet or you can contact me through the, the Facebook page or join in and ask questions. Like there's one person there yesterday said, is there much firewood around on the canning? And, you know, the, the discussion went along and explained things and other people asked questions like, how long should I take? And everybody joins in, there's photos. There's history, there's information. You learn, you know. It's good. 
What would the top three things, what are the must-see things in your book? What is it that, you know, the three things that you've got to make sure that you see when you're doing the canning stock route? Tricky question. Yeah, sort of like <laughs> about a dozen. <laughs> oh, well, what are they uh, then? Derba, Derba Hills, without a doubt. Yep. The Derba Hills. And all the, uh, make sure you know about all the artwork sites and where to go and where to camp and rest up and check out the various things that are, are there. Probably, to me, the Breeden Hills. They're right up in the wells around 40, 46 or thereabouts. Huge bank of hills. They're called actually the South Esk Tableland, and the um, Breeden Hills are part of that whole structure. And it's got every explorer under the sun has been through there. Carnegie and all, all sorts of people and there's names and carved on rock walls and there's rock holes and water tanks and places to camp and uh, wells sunk and lots of history, climb across the plateau and I just love the area, the spec- spectacular scenery. That's definitely, uh, and there's so much more that I'd like to try and investigate there myself, yep. uh, even though I've been there many times. And so that's definitely the, the top two. And then after that, uh, you've got Thring Rock and uh, the various uh, spots, Windditch uh, and the, all of those places. They're the um, features that stick out. But uh, to me, it's just being in the desert, sand dunes, desert oak groves. I mean, you haven't lived if you haven't camped the night in a grove of desert oaks. There's something about the uh, slight wind uh, just going through the little pine look like leaves and serenading you to sleep no I'm not a poet but you know I, I just love sleeping in um, desert oak groves lovely country where are the big sand dunes because to me they sound pretty exciting and, and like a bit of fun whereabouts they, are they well they uh, the biggest the bigger ones north probably there's a big patch of them between 23 and 33 and then there's a big flat area south of 33 for about two or three wells and north of 33. It's flattish or they're not very big. And then they're really bigging in in the well number, high 40s right through the, to the 50s. Some of them are just enormous. And when the, um, when the wheel pad was put through by the, um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, when the surveyors went through in 68, um, they they put their own wheel pad in to get right up to well 35. North of that, and there was a road leading down to Alice Springs that uh, Len Bedell had put in. North of that, a surveyor by the name of Johnson, he had to survey a line which had nothing to do with going to the well. So he pretty much did as much as he could, the straight line to Billaluna. And that's why... On the northern sector, you've got to ride, drive 10, 12, 15 or 20 k's out to a well that's out off to the east or the west, then come back to the track again and then drive off and then go out again and come back again because uh, that that route was chosen for a different purpose. Mr. Surveyor Johnson. One last question. Are there a lot of abandoned vehicles and trailers out there? I won't say a lot, but the carnage is there for all to see. Yep. Yes, there is. And when, when, when I want to say a lot. Uh, there's not 50, but there's old Land Rovers that I remember the land, one particular Land Rover has been there since before I did the canning in the 90s. But last year, a Prado got uh, burnt out in, I think it was either April or May, right up the top there near Well 49. And they say it wasn't a Spinifex fire. It was an electrical fault that burnt the Prado out. The Prado went up like a tinder box and there's hardly anything left of it. And it burnt out the whole area around the well, you know, with, uh, I don't know how far out, but uh, I've seen drone shots of the well 49 and everything's burnt to a crisp every direction. And it included the grave there for a chap by the name of Jack Smith who died there uh, and he had some internal problems. Uh, he'd been kicked by a horse and... The further he went, the sicker he got, and he eventually died. And they oh, buried wow. him there. They buried him there. He was there in, oh, when did, when did uh, Lanigan bring him down? In the mid-40s. 
40s, I think. And his grave, the, the timbers around his grave were completely destroyed by the fire. It was so hot it melted the aluminium plaque that was on the grave side. Turned it into a lump of uh, goop. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Phil. Yeah. You've <laughs> you literally wrote the book on the Canning Stock Route, which I'll include uh, some links in the show notes for um, for people yeah. to, to find, for those who want to do a bit more research on it. I'm sure everyone who's listened to this is either is going to be a lot more interested in heading out there and having a look at this um, amazing part of our country. It is. It's wonderful country. All to me, all the desert country is wonderful. Hey, you know, there's the the Northern Territory, the South Australian, and the uh, western part of Queensland, the, the New South Wales, etc. All that desert country. That's what I like. I don't. I leave the pastoral country and hit the desert country. That's when my holiday starts. Yep. Not until then, yeah. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed having a chat, and if I can be of any help to anybody, as I said. Yeah, I'll include it, or whatever. Yeah, I'll include some details for the Facebook page so that people can yeah. um, get in there and because yeah, to be, I, I think oh, I just feel really sad for those people who were driving along and weren't seeing anything of the things that they could have seen. You spend all of that effort, and for a lot of people, it'd be almost a once in a lifetime trip. Particularly if you're yeah. coming from the eastern states, you, yeah. you really should be doing a bit of research beforehand to find out the things that you want to be seeing if you're going to yeah. go all the way to do that could take you well over a week just to get to one end of it. Yep. You know, and and, uh, and don't turn it into a race. I I see people trying to do things like, um, we're going to come up the Tanami, go down the stock route, and then when we get to the bottom end, we're going to go out on the gun barrel. And I mean, the gun barrels, uh, the corrugation country, uh, well, if it's not the same as the Canning stock route, it's worse. Yeah. <laughs> And they and they try and combine the two, and it's a bit hard on the vehicle to try and do do that. You know, probably only the toughest vehicles that handle it are the um, the seventy series personnel carriers and 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 the Utes. Yeah, which is why which is why mining companies buy them, I suppose. They tend to to do well, providing they're not super overloaded. There was a Nissan Patrol last year that burnt out not far from the. Um, the 49 well where the um, Prada got burnt, it broke the chassis. And you can go onto the, the Canning Stock Group Facebook page and you'll see this Nissan Patrol and the chassis cracked like you broke a carrot. Wow. It's just snapped. And I've got photos of when it just happened and now it's uh, been tipped on its side and things have been souvenired, you know, diffs are gone and all sorts of time. Everything's gone and it's been picked over but yeah the only thing that could have happened there is either two things super overloaded or a new thing that seems to be coming to the fore is you've got say uh, with your suspension if you put a poly airbag in poly airbag type thing in if you pump it up too hard you're putting all the stress of the weight of the vehicle on one spot whereas previously you had spring hangers and all sorts of things to share the load and you put it all in one spot and you're making it twice as bad mm, yep and that's something that i've been talking to with ron moon and that and we we all sort of have noticed this happening to youths mainly and the first question we want to know is does it have poly airbags or the equivalent of and the answer is yes and then we know what's happening overloading and thinking that it's a spring and it's not. It's an aid to your suspension. It's not a replacement unless you get the proper ones, which are a different kettle of fish. But even the proper ones, I think, are putting all the stress in one point. You know, the real suspension bags they they, they use on trucks and that. Yep, yep. As, as, as against the ordinary poly airbag. But again, the vehicle's engineered by Nissan, Toyota, Isuzu, or whoever, to uh, engineered in a certain way to distribute the weight on the chassis, and if you if you go and change that by having 45 psi in your poly airbag, the uh, the mounting points aren't carrying any any load. You've shifted it all, and you could end up with problems like I just described yeah. with a Nissan Nissan Patrol. Not going to end well. No. No. Excellent. Well, I thoroughly, thoroughly in, enjoyed our chat. 
No, it's been really good. You've um, shared a lot of information. Pleasure to help. And I hope uh, anyone doing the canning, you'll have a ball. Thoroughly enjoy yourself. Stop and smell the roses. And you'll meet wonderful people out there who will tell you things I've seen. And don't forget to see this or look out. There's a big hole on the top of this dune. Uh, We nearly ran into it. You'll get all sorts of help and advice. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Most people are really nice and most people are helpful and friendly. Mm. Yep. Well, All right. I'm hoping to get over there to do it one day. It would be a pleasure to see if we can match up or talk or meet or something. You know? It'd be good, yeah. Yeah. No All worries. Right. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. you. You take care of yourself and we'll uh, maybe catch up another time. That'd be great. Cheers, right mate. Then. What an amazing discussion. Phil is just the perfect person to talk about when it comes to the Canning Stock Group. Not only an avid four-wheel driver who really knows his stuff, but an avid historian as well. So he really knows his stuff about the place that he goes four-wheel driving to. And I think that it's really come out in the interesting stories that have come out. I didn't really know a lot about the Canning Stock Route at the start of this. You know, I knew that it was one of the iconic tracks in Australia. It's on a lot of people's bucket list. And Phil has demystified a whole lot of it. And, you know, I think the really important thing is he's made it a lot more accessible for a lot of people. I'm hoping that there'll be people who'll be listening to this podcast who are going to go, I never thought I'd be able to do that, but I'm going to have a crack at it. And more importantly, for those people who do have a crack at it, he's provided a whole heap of information that's going to be really useful for us when we we go planning on doing the canning stock route. So um, I'm going to include a whole heap of information in the show notes. Uh, Don't forget to check them out. If you've enjoyed this, then please, you know, leave a review in iTunes. It really helps us to get the word out there. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you on the track someday. Bye. 4x4earth.com is used by over 200,000 people every month to find great tracks, organize trips, and find out how to better enjoy exploring the great outdoors. There's over a thousand tracks and 300 campsites ready for you to explore. So check out 4x4earth.com today and sign up to get access to the track information, ask questions and meet other 4x4 earthers. Membership is completely free. If you're looking for a good route, check out 4x4earth.com today.